Are you ready to think big and act bold? Then you are in the right place. This is Innovative Entrepreneurs, the podcast that will bring you the stories, insights, and tips from some of the most successful and innovative entrepreneurs in the world. I am your host, Erica Bailey, and I am here to help you start, scale, and sustain your own entrepreneurial journey. Let's get started. I am thrilled to be joined by Mr. Glenn Paul. He is a Princeton graduate and the founder of Dot Photo, the first online photo storage platform that was launched in 1999. Glenn's journey is remarkable, involving multiple sales and buybacks of Dot Photo. He's also known for his affordable, unlimited storage model that's just $1.67 per month. Glenn has been recognized as the SBA Small Business Person of the Year in New Jersey and Region 2. Under his leadership, Dot Photo was named Growth Company of the Year by New Jersey Tech Council. He's also led organizations like CompTIA and the Association of Imaging Executives. Today, Glenn will share his insights on the early days of digital photos, his company's journey, and his innovative pricing strategy. One thing I want to say also is that I owe Glenn some gratitude and some apologies because I have, (laughs) this poor man has been dealing with me and changing schedules and he has been gracious and kind and that's the type of person we want in our lives, right? Well, Glenn, welcome to my podcast again. Thank you, Erica. We're going to have to stop meeting like this. I would like to meet more like this and less like, uh, I'm sorry, Glenn. I'm sorry, Glenn. (laughs) So talk to me about dot photo, right? So what is dot photo? So uh, dot photo was started just because I wanted to have decent prints from a 640 by 480 early Epson camera that was about the size of a book. So even before dot photo, we started a company called photosbynet.com. And if you go to archive.org and you see like one of the very last images of photos by net, just set up a pretty simple site to take your pictures and upload your pictures. And we would print them at a moto photo, which was my original partner. And uh, we got so many orders that we couldn't print them. I went over there one Friday afternoon and and said, I I don't care if we make money or not, but we got something going here and people clearly like this. We had to get these orders out. And after about an hour, I could see that we could work all weekend (laughs) and we would never get the orders out. So we had to go and raise some money and buy some new equipment that would be higher speed. And um, and that's what we that's when we started that photo in 1999. But I think our, our claim to fame is probably having the first photo processing um, site online, which was Photos by Net. In any case, I know you like to ask entrepreneurs, you know, yeah, why do you do yeah, what you do? And I often think, why does anyone do anything? They do? My um, my mentor uh, liked to say as he got older that uh, he, he really felt that you couldn't make anybody do anything. You know, you can set up uh, some uh, incentives and you could nudge people, but, you know, you can't make anybody do anything. You kind of have to want to do it, right? And I look at all the things that I've done, and it's mainly just because I wanted to see them, right? So in that case, I wanted to see decent prints coming out of a little digital camera. When at the time, all you could print was uh, inkjet printer, printers, right? And then you get streaks, mm-hmm. and it was slow it was on a piece of paper that wasn't very attractive and it wasn't cut. It's kind of like you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Right. So it, it is, yeah. it's, you have to want to do it. You have to want to, you have yes. to, want to do something. I heard the, I heard the greatest example Ooh, of that me. recently. I mean, the, the all time best example of somebody who just wanted to do something. Uh, David Byrne, the head of the talking heads was being, uh, or the founder of the talking heads, I guess was being uh, interviewed on NPR. Okay. And, and he says, well, yeah, I was uh, in the chorus in high school and they threw me out because I couldn't keep the, the tune. And, uh, and the woman interviewing him says, well, gee, that's, that's awful. I mean, everybody gets to sing in the chorus in high school. I've never even heard of anybody being thrown out. She says, well, what, what made you keep going? You know, that's just absurd. He says, well, I just liked it. I, I'd like to tell you that I had some grand plan, but I just liked it. And I thought I would just keep trying to sing and making music. And, you know, now he's made tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. He's a very, very successful uh, um, musician. and." Never give up, man. It's, Never give up. But, you know, just happiness is a choice. Example. That is what my watch just yeah. told me. It's like, 
Happiness is a choice. And that's I, exactly what we're, we're talking about here. You have to make the choice that you want to do something that you, that you want to invest. Like this is your thing, right? And, and being happy is your choice. So, wow. That was like perfect timing. I don't know if you're always happy about it, but you're doing it just because you want to do it. I, I'll give you another example yeah. that's, okay. that's closer to home. So I was trying to figure out where dot photo okay. was going to go, where, where the whole photo business was going to go. And I'm thinking, okay, this wall is going to be a little thin, um, applique at some point where I can go like this and draw a screen and I can have whatever pictures I want to have on there. And dot photo is going to ultimately become more of a broadcasting service than a printing service. Because when we first started, people printed one out of every two pictures and now maybe they print one out of every 2000, right? It's more of a storage and sharing thing. And, and, uh, that happened very quickly after we started, but now, um, now people want to take their best pictures and they want to share them and they, they might want to put them up in the wall or they might want other pictures. So I put up a cheap screen in the living room and my wife said, I don't want to watch TV here. This, you know, this is nice room. We don't want to, I said, no, I just want to see what kind of pictures we would like. So of course we started with family pictures and they're great, but you get tired of family pictures all the time. You've seen them, right? You know what makes a great family picture? A mug, oh. right? There's, there's my wife as a baby and her mother. And there she is on our wedding day with her mother. You know, so now this is, this is all chipped and everything. I should get a new one, but I love this mug, right? And, uh, and this is a picture of my mom, which I colorized. She that was a nurse. Beautiful. And it's a, it's a pillow, right? So when my mother was in the nursing home and dying, I made this pillow because I wanted the nurses to know that she was somebody. She wasn't just another bed. You know, and uh, and they would look at oh, she was so beautiful, and, look, and it was great too because it was colorized. And I love the pillows because they live with you, you know, and you have them there, and they fall over, and you set them up, and just I love having pictures. I have pillows. a picture just like that of my mother somewhere. So we're yeah. gonna get in contact because that is beautiful, and I'd love to get you know my me and my sister one, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. I mean she's yeah. and she's here with us, thank God, but um. Yeah. I mean, she's an amazing nurse and she's done it. She was a psych nurse. I mean, she worked, you know, in, um, in trauma and ICU for a while. Um, but she's been a psych nurse, like, oh, very long time. So, um, I, I have a lot of love and blessings for nurse, but that is beautiful. I mean, you could do anything with those pillows. I, I I'm seeing like kids favorite dog or, you know, stuffed and, you know, something like that, that they have now on their bed. Right. So now they have a, of their favorite sure. dog on their pillow on their bed. Like, oh, this is so much fun. Right? <laughs> well, anyway, we started with uh, family pictures and then and they got old pretty fast. And then we tried streams of pictures from the internet and they were all loaded with junk and resolution and, and everything else. So I was reading um, at the back of the Economist magazine. There was an art opening in Belgium, I think. And I liked some of the paintings. So I started putting up some paintings. And my wife said, what? I didn't know you liked art. A few paintings here, but I don't know much about art. I just like this. And she said, well, I minored in art. And uh, let's get some more. So we got 500 of the greatest paintings in history. They're in the public domain. And we put them on a little stick. And then we put them in a... Uh, we put them in this little uh, laser etch box and called it the Billion Dollar. Wow, okay. Because it's, it's about $10 billion oh, worth yeah. of art. I can only imagine. If you could buy them, right? And you put the stick in your TV and you turn it into the greatest art gallery in history. And now we've sold an awful lot of them uh, on the Sharper Image and on Amazon uh, just because, you know, it was something that we wanted. And we get great pleasure out of it. And after after I put it up, I thought, yeah, I'd like to know what these pictures are. So, of course, we changed changed everything so that you could see the name of the painter, the name of the painting, the year it was painted, and, and the museum where you could see oh. it. And then we made a video out of it because the TVs are all weird and wonky from like, they've got like 1985 software mm -hmm. in them, right? So you can just watch the video and see all 500 paintings. And you just leave it on for days and you start to fall in love with these paintings and learn about them. And, and that's kind of yes, fun. You know? Yes, especially if you don't know much about art. That's amazing. What a great idea. What a great if, idea. If you're housebound. And now we have one for national parks and we got one for kids. Uh, called great art for kids that's amazing what a great idea honestly what a great idea so we uh we got that photo going and the print counts came down 
and uh, the board of directors was most mostly a bunch of small business people and going, we need to print more. You, have, you must print more. And I said, well, there are there are carrier groups in the Pacific, and they're loading pictures up to that photo, and then their uh, relatives in the Midwest are looking at their photos, and they're uploading their photos, and the carrier groups can communicate with their families. Okay. You know, you're talking like 2002. And uh, I said, well, that's, that's great, but, you know, that's not helping us because we, we can only make money when we print. I said, well, I don't know. I think that uh, I think that sharing is probably going to be it. And by the way, this Facebook is going to be bigger than us someday. And they said, well, they'll never monetize it because, you know, we understand accounting. <laughs> they'll never monetize that. Yeah, that never worked out. It's too bad. At one point, uh, I thought, okay. Let's let's really share. Let's help people tell a story because a picture is is really a story yes, element. It is. It's a yes, piece it of the story. So um, so we set it up so that you could have um, just automatically take a bunch of pictures uh, in a in a group and put a music track. You can choose your own music track or upload your own music track. You could have Ken Burns effects between them. You could have voice on each image. You could have titles on each image, and it was called the Dot Photo Show. And I made a dot photo show as an example, and it was seen 7 million times on YouTube. Because it would also take and it would plug it into YouTube, so we didn't have to do all the all the bandwidth yes, of yes. sharing this thing. People loved it, and the board hated it. You'll never monetize oh. that. They won because Steve Jobs killed Flash, and it was all done in Flash. But I, I would really like to get back. That, I think that's a fantastic idea. What? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. We were serving 600,000 shows a month in 2006. Oh. So, and how many markets? So that was, uh, well, I was thinking that that would actually be our marketing because when people share a show to, uh, yeah. uh, to YouTube, they would see yeah. our logo, mm -hmm. right? Or when they would send it to their friends, they would share it and people said, well, how'd you do that? And you know when it was really powerful it was when someone passed away. People would call us up and say, how can, how can we do this? And at, at that point, we could even make a CD or D, a DVD and send it out with this you know, mm -hmm. show on it. Wow. So it's, it really is all about uh, um, not just storage, but telling a, telling a story. story. So talk to me. You, you, you created Dot Photo. You sold Dot Photo. You got it back. Am I right there with the, the timing? Like, how does that work in business? Like, what was your reasoning behind that? Well, I can tell you why it happened because we created the uh, one of the first uh, photo apps for uh, Brew, which was Qualcomm's binary runtime environment for wireless. Right there was Java, so Qualcomm said, "Well, we'll have Brew. That'll be our thing." And Brew was Brew was used on uh, on Verizon, and I think AT and T. We had the number one photo apps for AT and T and Verizon, and um, it was kind of cool. You know, it would allow you to see your photos from dot photo on your phone, which was a big deal in in the very early days. And this uh, eventually uh, interested venture capitalists, and they put some money in. And uh, then they said, "All we want to do is mobile, because it's all mobile." Okay, well, mobile's just technology. You know, I think any business is, is must deliver a solution. And I was putting together solutions, and that was just an extension of what we were doing. They just wanted that to be the business, so they weren't even interested in the photo site. And they decided they were going to sell it. And mm -hmm. um, I way overbid everybody else because I thought it was the right thing to do, and that was. Probably not the brightest thing I ever did, but uh, uh, I owed the money at the end of 2008. And I don't know if, if you remember 2008, 2009, the world. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That's why we started our company, because we couldn't find jobs that would. I mean, I had a master's degree. He had a bachelor's degree. We had years of experience. We couldn't find jobs. So, yeah, those those were a few hard, hard years. But go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So we had we owed them. Um, more money, and we had to make a quick sale of the company in 2009. Wow. And then I had nothing to do for a little while. And a friend said, "Hey, can you help me take my two million dollar wound care company um, uh, national, it's a regional company?" And since you know, she could see my mother was a nurse, and I thought, "Well, that sounds like a good thing to do." And by the way, I know all about photography. So what if we took pictures of the wounds and gave out tablets, and then those pictures would come in centrally, and a, a very qualified nurse could uh, uh, tell people how to address these difficult nursing home wounds, and it was it was a great ride. I really enjoyed it. I got to do all the packaging for the company and the, the software and the, the whole thing. It was really fun. The the company's now on three continents, and uh, they're private. I think they're about a hundred million dollars. Our um, our software really only failed once. And that was last year, and um, it just stopped working. 
and we, we couldn't figure out right away what was mm -hmm. wrong with it. But when you set up a system, you have to set all the variables, right? So the order variable went from one to a million, and it hit a million. <laughs> so process the million orders, uh, and it does uh, documents the wounds. And it turns out that if you pay attention to anything, yeah. right, you tend to do better. Like Al Gore used to say, if you have a mile per gallon indicator on your car, you tend to drive that. Right? You use less gas, and you're watching this little plain little game. When you're watching wounds every week, when you're documenting them, they tend to get better. And so it was a it was a terrific thing. They have since replaced us with a with a software that doesn't cost them, or actually it costs them probably a lot more to develop than they could have just bought it from us. But we own the software. If anybody wants some great wounds, oh, so. that's good to know. Can you give me information that we can put in the links below so that they can contact you if if they need? Sure. Yeah. Hey, they can go to Texler.com. No, would you spell it? T E X T L E R. T E X T L E R dot com. Hold on. Yeah. It's called, our, our company was called Texler because we originally thought we were going to make a database that could be manipulated by uh, text messages, which is really kind of cool. You know, you wouldn't have to open anything up. You just send a text and put it into your database or query. We didn't actually make that database, but that's why we called the company. Yeah, okay. And we ended up getting uh, going sideways into this uh, wound care thing because it was it was fun and it was a good opportunity and uh, and it worked out. So, and then about uh, 2016, the guys who had bought the company who bought that photo, they never honored my contract with them, and uh, I was uh, talking to them about that. And they said, "Well, why don't you just take it back? Because we don't want to do this anymore." <laughs> <laughs> they kind of hadn't done uh, everything right. Uh, they hadn't really taken care of customers. So I was happy to have it back. And um, I like the business. I like the customers. I talk to the customers. And, um, you know, that's that's a, that's a fun business. Well, good. I mean, it sounds like you've kind of had your hands on a lot of things. Uh, probably a lot of experience through just life, man. Okay, so... As a, well, you are obviously a seasoned entrepreneur, right? You have a lot of experience. You've bought and sold businesses. How do you identify and capitalize on emerging trends in technology in business? How are you finding this technology and what are you using to capitalize and grow and uh, excel to the next level? I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> I'll give you an example of my best and worst decision. And you can see this in my LinkedIn profile. It was a speech I gave at the Pyramid Club in Philadelphia about 2016, about the uh, impact of technology on society. Okay. And uh, I noted uh, at that time that uh, in, in the speech that um, there was a company that my partner and I had, had found in our screens. And uh, we, I used to write this column called Perfect Company, perfectcompany.com. And it was for my, mainly my friends. It was about investments that I thought were good investments. So we had scanned 7,000 companies. And one of them that was really doing well that year, our, our portfolio was up at, at years 37% at the time of the speech. And um, the company was doing better than all the other ones was a little company that most people thought was a gaming company. Okay. And so they asked, how do you capitalize on something? Well, it's usually some obscure knowledge that you have or some obscure interest like the two or three things that I've just mentioned that you just happen to have and you want to do them, right? And very often... Um, People make uh, two mistakes. One, they, they don't do any research to see if somebody's already doing it and learn what they can from that. But then they also overestimate uh, the power of competitors. And the truth is that most most big companies, at most big companies, the, the executives don't want to uh, put themselves on the line. Right? Nobody wants to go and do this new thing because, you know, we're all here at the big company. We want to do a little bit better next year. And we all want to make our big salaries. And uh, I don't really want to do something that's going to risk that in my family's uh, future. Right. Okay. So the competition is usually from smaller companies, and then these little companies grow, and then somebody takes them over. And that's what I thought would happen to this little company that I had the obscure okay. knowledge about. The obscure knowledge was this. We deal with billions of images at Dot Photo. And one day, the CTO said to me about some problem we were having. Maybe it was turning them or upgrading them or whatever. He said, oh, Glenn, why don't we just send it through the GPU instead of the CPU? And I said, why would you do that? He said, well, it's, you know, it's much more powerful. It's turning on thousands of dots and different colors all the time. Those GPUs are more powerful than CPUs because they're just chunk one, one step okay. at a time, right? And uh, I thought, well, that's interesting. I never thought of that. So about 2015, uh, this one little GPU company announces that it's going to start selling like these $20,000 AI machines. And they were going to like hobbyist conventions and pushing, uh, you know, AI. 
And, uh, and so I bought NVIDIA. And uh, it had, a, I think, a $2 billion market cap when I bought it. And the executives were buying it, and they were buying back their own stock, and they were profitable, and their sales were growing. It really was the perfect company. And when I gave the speech, I said, I said, you know, this is this has gone to a $28 billion. It's got a $28 billion market cap, which, you know, seems really great, right? And it grew for a while, and then it was going up and down and uh, during COVID. And I was thinking, boy, I don't want to lose all this. Well, and, and I sold it, and that was the worst mistake I ever made. So my, the best thing I ever did was buy NVIDIA stock. And I made enough to get us through COVID and help the family and everything. But it would be worth $20 million today if I had kept that relatively small position. Oh, shit. Now, the good news is that some of my readers and friends did keep that stock. And uh, one of them was an old friend of mine from Atlanta, and he's coming out to New York. He's like, well, I, I rented you a suite at the uh, plaza. Uh, from, uh, we're going to go see a great show here. <laughs> Your wife. Okay, great. Thanks for rubbing uh, it in my face. <laughs> no, 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 no. He's, he's sweet. I have, I have friends who, who never do anything like that, but he's like, yeah. Like, I, have, I have a few friends really that are like cake. that. It's just, again, that kindness, yeah. right? And it's, it's kindness that they are giving without expecting anything in re- return. And that is true. Yeah kindness you know what i mean and that is where i believe that we will all become better people as if we have gratitude and kindness it's simple it's not necessarily easy but it is simple so yeah <laughs> got off on a little tangent there well, didn't i <laughs> that makes the world go around love it love it okay so now right uh in business maybe not necessarily your business but in business what marketing strategies do you find to be the most effective? I think the number one thing is just paying attention to your customers. And, and I and it's kind of trite maybe because everybody talks about customer service, uh, yeah. but they don't do it. So, and, and most executives that I've dealt with, you know, are so-called high-powered executives. They'll never pick up the phone. They're afraid to talk to them. They'll talk about customer service as something that other people should do, but, you know, they're, they're above that. And you really feel it when yeah. you talk to customers. You know, I talked to a guy today who's ordering ornaments from that photo. And uh, we're having a, a trouble getting those orders through because they're double-sided. And it's a solvable problem. So we're solving. Right. But, um, you know, I, I called him and listened to him. And, uh, you know, he had a good point, And I internalized that we're going to fix this mm-hmm. problem. Or we got ornaments in the middle, middle of summer. Right? That shouldn't be a problem right now. But yeah. so. Um, the reason that it's so important is that I see so many times I want to buy something and I'll knock on the door and I'll, you know, try to buy it. And it's, it's, it's a mess. And, um, he can't get hold of anybody, right? Nobody will fix it. So we do get back to people. We do actually talk with people. There's a lot of people who still like to talk to a, an actual person. We have documented everything very thoroughly on the site. So if, if you're up in the middle of the night and you want to know something, it's pretty much all there doing this for a while. I had a great customer experience one time. Uh, I was trying to put a press release out with a company called uh, Issuer Direct, a publicly held company. A smallish, like, I think about a, a $30 million market cap. Mm-hmm. And I was kind of interested in the company, too, so I was trying out their services. It's a Friday night, right? I'm trying to place this thing, and the software just isn't working. So I called them up, and I get somebody in the newsroom, and he says, um, uh, there's nobody here now, but, uh, you know, I'll see what I... So I get a call back from a guy, and I recognize the guy I recognize his name and he doesn't tell me who he is. He's the, he's the president and the major shareholder of this company calling me back on a Friday night. And he says, we'll have this fixed by Monday. And, uh, and they did. And, uh, this other company that I, I do some work with, uh, we've, we've signed a, a deal with them and, and we're issuing press releases through them. So he, now you're a brand ambassador, right? Because now you've had that experience that makes you feel like, you are more than just a number in a system. You are a human being trying to solve a problem which requires other human beings. I had an experience, same type of experience. It was in the medical field though, but this had never happened to me before when I lived in Arizona. My son came in, I took my son in for a, a doctor's appointment and he was miserable, like miserable. And, you know, did everything the doctor said, bring him home, long night, fevers, 
um, laying on the couch early in the morning. And as soon as that doctor's office opened, they called the doctor called me directly and not the assistant, not the MA, the doctor called me to check on my son. Now, who do you think has been my primary care provider since that moment? Right. Yeah. 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 It's been, and it's for yeah. my whole family. Right. I'm like, I trust you now. I know that you care about what you're doing and about your clients, patients, sorry, yeah. but it's the same thing. Yeah. Right. Um, and yeah, picking up the phone nowadays, you know, I, I have a, a friend who we do, we're going to do a whole sales training. His name is Ron Honingsberg. I don't know if I'll ever say that right. Ron talks to me about, he says, you know, text communication, email communication, you cannot see the body language. You cannot hear the influx, you know, the fluctuation of the tone. You cannot see facial expressions. So it is so incredibly hard for clients, for patients, for anybody, for us to, to understand what that, that tone or the messaging is, what it's intended for. And I think way too often uh, we end up hurting relationships because we're not taking the time to meet them for lunch or to do a FaceTime um, or to you know, pick up the phone and call them. At least then they can hear the fluctuation in your voice and they can start yes. to, you're building that relationship and then they become brand ambassadors for life. I mean, it's, it's really just a first moment of kindness and then making sure you are taking care of them from that moment on truly makes an impact. It's the cheapest marketing you can find. That's kind of related to my first rule of oh. communication, which I wish I had discovered earlier in life. It's, it's sometime in the last 10 years I discovered okay. this. Talk bad, write good. And almost everybody does just the opposite. Like, you're the employee of the month, right? The boss comes over to you, hey, uh, Erica, congratulations on being the employee of the month. Here's a, you know, you're going to get this bonus and you're going to parking spot. Isn't that great? Oh, we're going to have a little party for you later today. Thank you. And he feels good and, you know, he's done his job and he feels good. Now, if he's got some bad news, he says, dear Erica, you're fired. <laughs> Famously firing people by email now, right? Like the worst possible message yeah. you could get. So, uh, so I, my rule is just the opposite. It, instead, if, if you're the employee of the month, put some time into it. Send a note. And think it through, dear Erica, and thank you for these three things that you've done. It made such a difference to us. You're a leader in the company. Uh, we're going to have a cake and a, a little bonus. And, you know, you've been just terrific. And we're so glad to have you here. Send the note. And then go to the desk. I just want to make sure you got that note. And, you know, we appreciate everything you've done. You will take that note and you put it in your file and you'll show it to your family. Someday that guy will be dead and you'll go, look at this. Hi. He was a, wasn't he a nice person? I have this to remember, you know, memorialize the good things. Now, the bad news is just the opposite. And it's, it's hard to do. This is the hard part of it. Where if I, if I have the feeling that this might be bad news, like one time a guy called and said, uh, Hey, or he sent me a nice, we want to do this with your software. And it was so far afield. I just said, well, you know, I'm sorry, but that's not really okay. what we do. It's not in our contract. And he screwed everything us for, up for us. He was so angry. And what I do now, if I have the slightest inkling that it might be bad news, I'll call the person and say, you know what? Um, here's the situation. And they will hear me and we'll talk talk it back and forth. And if it's really bad news, I will do my best to get in front of them. And sometimes I go into these, I have gone into meetings, even saying a little prayer going in like, I don't know what's going to happen here, but you know, <laughs> this is okay. Now the worst, the worst thing that really can happen is that somebody's going to scream at you and threaten you and uh, fire you. Right? But that's part of the drama yes. of life. So, so that's, that's another rule, which is embrace the drama. You know how, most people say, I hate yeah, drama. Yeah. I just I hate mm -hmm. drama. But they're involved in drama all the time. And then they go home and they watch six hours of drama on TV. Most of us have so much drama in our life that if we embrace the drama, we go, wow, look at this. I can't believe this is happening in front of my eyes. I've got a front row seat to this craziness. That's what I think of. <laughs> 
<laughs> love it. Oh, I am seriously changing my outlook on drama this moment. What? Yeah, and and people are telling you the kind of person yes. they are, right? You've got this incredible situation that has been building and building, and now you're going to find out what kind of person they really are. And it's kind of interesting. That is really interesting. Really interesting. What is your background before here? Like, what what did you are you have you been like a serial entrepreneur your whole life? Or well, like you, I graduated into a time when there were yes. no jobs, and um, and so I ended up uh, selling in this little uh, three hundred square foot computer store. Uh, behind a print shop in the basement, you know, the, these are Apple computers before there were floppy drives for Apple computers. And um, so I just helped them expand their their uh, company. And uh, I asked for a piece of the business and they got very angry that I would even ask. And then I worked for Dow Jones for nine months and I asked for a 10% raise there. And they said, well, you know, we're on the union here and nobody gets a 10% raise. And I said, well, how, could I have $58 billion instead? <laughs> <laughs> Did you really say that? No. Okay, no, but didn't. it was in your head. <laughs> no, no, I'm referring to a, a oh. Musk's award. Oh, yesterday. okay. It's like, yeah, no, it was 56 billion. Was that what he got? I don't know. Billion? I wasn't even paying yeah. attention. Oh yeah, yeah. He went to a shareholder and said, "Look, this this company would be nothing without me, and I might not have an, an incentive if you don't honor my contract and give me 56 billion dollars." Oh, so oh, okay. they they voted it. Now the company for the last four years has had about thirty-seven billion in profits, and this guy has a part-time job when he's not doing uh, X and SpaceX and uh, the Boring Company and these other things that he does. But they're like, we're like, well, we better keep his attention because only he could. Yeah, run this yeah. We need to give him. You know, it's it's so far beyond the pale. I mean, it's just read on why. Yeah. Fifty-six. Well, billion. yeah, I'm seeing, but I'm seeing forty-six billion. I'm seeing fifty-six, but I'm seeing more fifty. Fifty-six billion dollars. Yeah. Imagine. Isn't that great? Think. I mean, think about what that would do if it was spread throughout the community to the people. I just think it's it's funny when you do a good job at a company and you go, well, uh, you know, I'd like a, I'd like a little raise, and I came here, I took a cut pay, and they go, well, the company's the company's not making enough money. It's not making enough money. So that would be, you know, that uh, 5% or 10%. <laughs> this is a company that made $37 billion in total the last four years. And we're going to give this guy $56 billion. <laughs> it's Maybe really over the top. There's going to be some sort of backwards reason for that. <laughs> I mean, it just doesn't make sense. It was a, it was a monstrous uh, uh-huh. incentive. Um, I'm going to have to read on that. Yeah, it's maybe, interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. But anyway. <laughs> Uh, there's never there's never been anything like that in the annals of compensation. Wow! And, and by the way, most of us entrepreneurs, and you know, everybody on this call is, uh, you know, we're we're looking to increase the value of our shares, right? And nobody's going to go and say, oh, well, let's give you some extra, like a whole lot extra. I mean, that's just pretty crazy. Anyway, that was let's a, give you more than we have made in the last four years combined. Yeah, because that makes sense. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, be, and it's a part-time job. <laughs> it's a part-time job. He probably it's doesn't part. even show up to. Okay, I shouldn't make judgments. That's awful. Oh. That's awful. <laughs> He's going to turn <laughs> that one. Oh gosh. Um, okay, so you know, I'm really big on content marketing, social media. You know, organic and paid, but I truly believe that organic social media. Um, can truly take uh, businesses to a whole new level. What are your thoughts on social media marketing? Well, I think the uh, the, the uh, offer that's almost too good to be true is probably something that you should get uh-huh. out there. Something that, that just gets people in into your <laughs> virtual shop or your actual shop or whatever yeah. it is, right? You have to have some very powerful offer. The first powerful offer is just to pay attention to people when they're trying to buy from you, which we talked about. And, and the second is to have something that's pretty great. Um, we have not done a great job of marketing the top photo yet. Yeah. But we, we do have a lot of great offers. I mean, the, the $19.99 a year for unlimited storage is pretty great. Uh, we have um, a good, it's a simple system, and there are no yeah. ads in it. And there's nothing that says, you know, when you go to most photo sites, it's like you're trying to buy something, and they're like, well, buy this. So don't forget to buy this and buy this. And now, now you're in the cart, and did you get your pens? Did you get your cards? Mm-hmm. Did you get everything else? You have to get 
I'm, I'm going to show that it works, but we don't do that. We're just, hey, don't buy this great stuff. Yeah. We have we have something called a backup book where you can just dump 760 pictures into it. And, and it's about the price of, um, actually, it beats the price of most four by sixes anywhere else, right? So you had to get a complete 12 by 12 book with 760 pictures in it. It's a great way to back up your pictures. We have nine cent prints. Wow. Nine cent four by sixes. <laughs> And if you're a, if you're a member and you order ten dollars of anything, you get free shipping. Right. That's a, that's a I think so too. Tip. I think so too. You know, you're talking about have, um, having you know these irresistible offers that will take people into or potential clients into the top of the funnel for you, um, and and that is the intention, or that's what you think about social media marketing. My like how we're seeing things changing now is. It's not about the sales. It's about talking to your people. It's about telling the stories of the mug, about telling the stories of the pillow, about, you know, just being authentic and real and, and excited about what you're doing and not afraid to share it because everybody is communicating on social media now. So like your Mm. referrals, right? Like the, you've done business through people loving your customer service, right? Well, now that level of service is represented through your social media without sales. They'll they'll come to you. If they believe in and they they see the value that you offer and, you know, it's a mixture, right? Because you're telling them about your specials, but maybe you're telling them about your specials while you're doing a, a short, you know, user generated content, right? You're talking in your phone and you're telling them about your specials. That will make much more impact than a static graphic that is telling them about their, their specials. And that's where we're going now. Um, and it's customer service related, but it's in a digital form. So it's your social media. Mm-hmm. People are asking questions. They're commenting. You get on there and you respond just like you're picking up the phone to call your client. You get on there as you and respond and say, hey, I'd love to talk to you more about this. Why don't you send me a private message? That is where people are communicating now. And so I love businesses that start and are based from referrals. You know, that's how we grew. And we never did our own marketing. We literally had all of our clients come through as referrals up until still we and we really don't do much of our own marketing, and so that is that is where that hmm. value is. But you still need to share it so that people know that you're providing that. You know, yeah. so I, I just love it. I love social media. I love content creation. I just think it's we are going into a very fast-paced digital age. Uh, where we are just so inundated with media and media and sales and media. If you can stand out from the crowd by being authentic and true, that is where you will get the business. Who cares about the competitors? There's enough for everybody. But people are going to come to you because they feel value and they feel trust and they know that you're going to take care of them. So anyway, that was my little rant on social media. (laughs) I'd like to talk more about that. We do have one interesting um, tool. Um, again, I was talking to our CTO and I was complaining about uh, Google and what a mess it's become and how difficult it is to find mm-hmm. anything. And how I was fooled into um, paying too much for a hotel room because I thought uh, guest reservations was the actual uh, link for a, a small hotel. And I thought they were using the service, but they weren't. I was They were just advertising at the top of the stack and I was paying 40% too much yes. for the room. Uh, I was, I was uh, complaining about that. He said, you know, you, you really don't want to use that anymore. There's a, there's a meta search engine that I use. And uh, I said, well, let's, let's put it on that photo. Let's make it uh, easy for people to get. He says, yeah, there's no advertising in it. And it combines the results of 35 different search engines. And so we set it up at search.photo.com. And it's, uh, it's just like search in the old days where you get good answers. <laughs> See, I use AI for that. <laughs> oh my goodness, Glenn. I enjoy you so much. Um, okay, so talk to me about this no brainer pricing. I mean, a dollar ninety seven for what? Uh un- wait, unlimited storage for a dollar sixty seven per month. I mean I mean that's that's less than 
everybody. So talk to me. How how are you making this possible? Or you don't have to give me the secret sauce, but give me something. Well, people upload their pictures from their phones and, uh, you know, they, they're with us for a long time. They uh, buy other things. And so it's a, it's a combination of that. And we keep our, we keep our costs pretty low. Oh, that's what I'm thinking. It's like, yeah. that is, how are you, like, how are you getting away with that? That is so cheap. Like, I'm just thinking the bandwidth on servers alone is costing more than that per month. I mean, wow. Uh, we're. We're pretty good at uh, final that. That's amazing. All right. Well, a dollar sixty-seven per month for unlimited storage for your photos. I mean, you can't get better than that. Um, and the image, the image size, by the way, can be up to six thousand by six thousand uh, pixels, which is a thirty-six uh, megapixel. Uh, that's huge. Uh, yeah, and uh, if you store your pictures on Facebook or yeah. someplace else, they're typically yes. downsized. And you think you think you got your pictures backed up there, but you don't. You're going to get a bunch of downsized pictures if you ever want to download them. Wow, I didn't even think about that. I know that, but I didn't even think about that. That's brilliant. So the way the way I use images, and I like Facebook, but right? I, I write on Facebook um, just to record things that I find interesting. So um, I'll upload a whole bunch of pictures to that photo, and then I'll just do a screen capture of the ones because I know. Or screen captures, of course, are not the whole picture. So when you upload a dot photo, you get a, a thumbnail, you get a screenshot, and then the large image is put away for printing. Right. So I'll just take the the screen image, which is good enough for Facebook, and I'll just paste it in, and I'll, I'll have uh, you know five or six um, representative um, pictures there for my trip to Iceland or whatever, um, or one picture I, I wrote a thing about AI recently. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll just upload a dot photo, and I'll pick the ones I want. I've got everything backed up, and I can write my little stories there. And now, this is not a dot photo product, but every two years, I go to my social book, and I get all my Facebook posts uh, printed out on about 380 pages uh, for about $90. And so, you know, instead of waiting till the very end of my life to write my memoirs, which are by that time, going to be whatever story I want them to be. I'm kind of writing it as I go along and saying, you know, this happened, this happened, this is what I'm interested in. And maybe someday my kids will look at these books that I'm accumulating every two years and they'll make that. That's there he was. That's really, really neat, though. I didn't even know that existed. I'm going to check that out. My social book? It's, it's, it's a great little product. I wish it were my product, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's a good way to uh, get your stuff up. I there. love that. Um, Okay, so what key advice would you offer to aspiring entrepreneurs um, looking to make their mark in the in the business world? First of all, uh, follow your instincts. Do what you want to do. I can think of a time once, uh, this was a, a long time ago, when my, my cousin said, uh, I'd like to do something entrepreneurial. And I said, well, I would like to... Uh, yeah, here's a, here's a little idea I've been toying with. This is back in the beginning of the computer industry, right? What if we make like little chocolate chips and we put them in a box, we sell, you know, a box of chocolate chips. It's kind of like the zeitgeist right now, right? Computer chips that are made out of chocolate. Wouldn't that be fun? So uh, we went to our advertising agency at the time and they convinced us that that would just be too technical. People couldn't get their heads around that. And what we should do instead is make a little box that kind of looked like a Macintosh and then chocolate diskettes would come out of it. Uh, and it was called the IDM, the Incredibly Delicious Machine. And it had a little manual on the side that a friend of mine who later became the editor of Esquire magazine wrote. So it was very clever, you know, a little manual. And then we got a whole bunch of these things made and they were stacked in the windows at Macy's at New York. And, you know, it was a cool little thing, but it, this concept was so weird that nobody bought it. Somebody, somebody else did chocolate chips, and they did very oh, well. Oh no! <laughs> and I should have stuck with the original somebody idea. Somebody keep right? telling you that that nobody's gonna. Your ideas are brilliant, and then they end up being like super rock stars. Everybody's like, "Oh no, that's not gonna work." <laughs> well, yeah, that's a good that's a good thing to know because people will tell you that. You know, people said Henry Ford was a crank because he was in he was in the barn behind his parents' house all the time tinkering with his stuff, and they were starting to worry about him. You know, um, but you know, first of all, go with your go with your instincts. Whatever it is that you want, there are probably other people that want it. And then, just when you think you've got everything right, um, pay attention to the customers because you're 
probably going to take a left turn someplace. And what's one thing I notice that people do is they spend a great deal of money on marketing, going to conventions, where I, I've never done a, I can't remember doing a really important deal at a convention. And I, I have discovered a lot more just talking to customers who have come in this door or who have called or sent me a note and said, well, I want to do this special thing or whatever, you know, and then I end up doing it for them. And then that that's where the business goes. Um, at one point, uh, Dot Photo was being used by um, wedding chapels in Las Vegas. So this one guy in the Elvis wedding chapel, he was there for the summer. He kept passing the, the picture taker. He said, you know, why don't we just do this at this new thing, Dot Photo? And, and they started to do it. And pretty soon we were doing tens of thousands of photos there and in all these other wedding chapels. We should have closed down the rest of the business and just focused on wedding chapels because it was such a big business. Uh, I think somebody else did that again, but you know, you could, you see all these opportunities just presenting themselves and you're like, Oh, I have this thing I want to do. So listen very careful to the, carefully to the customers. Just do it. Okay. Glenn, we stop every um, episode with who was the most or is the most influential or innovative entrepreneur that has impacted you. To answer your question, the person who was the, the greatest entrepreneur in, in my life was a guy named uh, Robert E. Clancy. He was a uh, Princeton 48, and I just happened to meet him when I was a very young man. He said that said Princeton should have a good computer store, and there are already all these computer stores, but I have a little plan, which I'd be embarrassed to look at today, and I brought it over to him, and we got to know each other for about nine months. And then one day, my uh, used Fiat wouldn't start in the rain again, and I called him up. I said, you want to do this or not? <laughs> and I think he was waiting for that. He wanted to see that I really wanted to do it. And uh, we borrowed some money from the bank and uh, we just grew that thing from uh, 35 million in sales. And it was, a, it was a great ride. And I learned a lot from him along the way. Early on, uh, in the, about nine months in, and this happens in almost every business, our accountants called us up and said, we want you to come into the office. And we did. And they said, well, we want you to know that you're technically bankrupt. And uh, I said, well, I think we're going to make it. I just, I just feel like it's going to Feel like it's turning where we're getting more customers we finished out the year with a million one in sales we made a small profit and then you know we, we do the thing really well and i remember going in with him to see uh, the folks at ibm and ibm was on top of the world at that point the largest most important uh, company in history and you had to have the ibm pc to sell and um we're going in for this big meeting in atlanta and uh trying to figure out what can we do for ibm and he says you know, there's nothing we can do for IBM. They're just going to have to like us. All right. Well, I mean, it, it makes sense. It makes sense. That's a, that's a pretty important role. He was an incredibly charming oh. man. And uh, we, had a, we had a good time in that meeting. And uh, to, to my surprise, they, <laughs> they gave us their, their influence. Oh. We ended up being the... We ended up being the largest distributor of IBM and Apple in New Jersey at the time. Okay, so where can our listeners find you? We'll obviously put all of the information in the show notes, but why don't you tell us where, where you want them to go? Well, they can go to dotpoto.com, photo.com. They can go to Billion Dollar Art Gallery. We have a new service coming out called picturethis.shop. Okay, what's that? Picture this will allow you to upload one picture from your phone and immediately see it on 16 different products in 3D. And then we'll give you the link. This is all free to use. Now you have a link. Maybe you just have a birth announcement or a graduation. Or you got a funny meme or um, it, it, the logo of your company. Uh, and now you've got on 16 products and here's the link. And you can put that link on your website or you can share it by email or social media or whatever. And then people can pick something off there and buy it if they want. And uh, and you can even uh, use it as your second job, right? You, you get some funny memes and uh, mark it up by 30%. Give us your PayPal address, and we will put money into your PayPal account every time somebody buys it. Interesting. The ultimate, most simple way to make a uh, to make a store online. Pick for this dot shop. I love it. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. Again, thank you for your patience and understanding with me. Um, you, We have been on a wild ride, and I'm just grateful that you um, have kindness in your heart. So uh, we will make sure all of your information is in the show notes. Again, 
I am so grateful for everybody who joins us. I know that we learned a lot today, at least I did from Glenn. Um, if you have anything to add, please, you know, put comments below. Reviews are always great. It makes people, other people hear and see the messages we have to share. And, you know, my guests really have some good stuff to share, uh, like share all of that stuff. And uh, again, thank you, Glenn. And I look forward to talking to you further. My pleasure. Nice to see you, Erica. Wow. What a great episode. I hope you had as much fun as I did. If you want more of this goodness, make sure you subscribe so that you get notifications for future podcasts. And if you found value from this, please share it with others. You can visit our website at cwgdigital.com. This is Erica Bailey. I am your host, and I will see you next time.